I think the important thing really is just to start talking and see what happens. Yeah. Because we don't need to do the whole thing. Mm. So, um, first podcast for 50 and coping, question mark. Question mark. You, George, are the producer of all of my podcasts, are you not? Yes. I don't know how that happened. No, I, d- I don't know how you got lumped with that either. <laughs> but you are. So I thought, because you are a man of eloquence and mm. gadgets. Ga- gadgets, yes. Eloquence. Okay. We're um, getting there. For the first time doing a podcast, I'm surrounded by a number of very large yeah. cameras that do marvellous trickery. It's true. You are, by trade, a photographer, are you not? Yes. Okay. Yes. You have said to me on many occasions, right, that mm. sometimes you don't, you're not sure whether you should be doing what you're doing or, or that, you know, do I even know? And I've said to you on occasions while I'm doing my metal work, yeah. I'm not sure I can make this. I don't know what's going on. See, yeah. So re- it's, it's been happening more recently. Mm. Um, especially since I started offering video as well, um, right. is that I'm getting jobs that are coming in that are just how the hell am I landing this sort of thing? Um, so yeah, the imposter syndrome is kicking in real hard sometimes. But uh, yeah, I'm, I imagine it's the same for you with your real network and how that sort of all started. And what everything. happened with me is. I metal work when I started was just complete magic and no oh you couldn't possibly do it yeah now of course uh, I can do it I can weld and I can fabricate and I can do all these things but every so often when customers come and ask me to make something my first reaction is oh they're (laughs) actually trusting me (laughs) yeah they're they're (laughs) trusting me to make something for these people why are they coming to me no so let's let's reverse the whole thing right okay so you how long have you been a photographer now so, been a photographer for I want to say three years professionally. Okay, that's when I actually started taking paid jobs. Okay, um, so before that, yeah, when you were at school and everything, were you interested in photography? Not really. I've I've always had a camera in my hand. Um, so you like, so since, you were then? Like, yeah, yeah, but not like <laughs> not like in the sense that like, I was it really like really into it. Like now, where I'll go into a, or I'll go to a shoot with a specific image in mind and like have a okay. specific edit. It, like that sort of thing it was always the way of like oh i got a good photo yay and that was sort of it uh, can i ask you something right. i'm going off on a tangent yeah, already on. when you go to a professional shoot yep. now do you know what shoot what what shot you're looking for do you yes so yeah oh, do you know, does, i've never even does, thought of that it dis- does depend on the client brief yeah because if the brief is if the brief's really clear then it's happy days and everything's fine you don't really have to worry about it and you know what you're doing yeah um but when the brief's not so clear, you sort of have to rely on the creative side of your brain going, hey, this will look good. Let's mm. try that. Let's do that. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's taken a while to get to the point now where I'm like, okay, I know what I need to do to make this look the best it possibly can sort of thing. Okay, so imposter syndrome, I imagine a lot of people feel yeah. in, in whatever yeah, they're doing. Yeah. So with you... You started off, presume, how did you get your start down the road to become a photographer? So, started out, that was, uh, I started out getting a camera from my pub job. Um, so, I initially called myself a barman. Well, yeah, um, but what, why did they give a barman a camera? Well, I, I already had a love for the, taking photos and all that, and I was always taking photos on my phone. Um, but they were like, oh, we need really good photos of food. So, I was like, oh, I'm going to get myself a camera and they were fortunate enough to be able to give me some money towards my first camera, like first proper digital camera. Um, and then essentially I was taking photos of the food on the pass and then taking it out. And then, and then right. like that sort of thing. But that's but, really yeah. interesting because they trusted you straight away. It wasn't straight away. No. So how, how away, do no. you arrive at them giving you money for a camera? So I took photos on my phone for a while, uh, just like of the, different setups like the Prosecco or the champagne out in the fridges or something like that at all or like a really cool dish yeah like uh they did like this big steak like a prime rib sort of thing it was a massive chunk of meat right and um chunk of meat yeah it was it was huge (laughs) um and essentially what happened was i showed the boss and said look look this is what i've done what do you think and he's like oh yeah they're really good what what do you reckon have you got a camera what do you reckon you could do i was like well i've got an old camera 
but it's not really up to this sort of level. And that was only on a like on an iPhone, right? Um, like one of the early ones. Um, and then from there, it sort of sort of went. Oh, okay, right. I can actually do this sort of thing. And like, I used that camera outside of work and got like headshot sessions put in together. And that was very peculiar because starting out on a little tiny digital camera, yeah, with one lens and a SD card that could maybe just about handle about a thousand photos. Right. I was terrified, and I was editing everything on my phone, and I didn't have any of the stuff that I've fortunate enough to have now now you have all of the stuff all the stuff which is fantastic (laughs) um is that is that right so you're in that situation people are asking you for more shots right yeah that that's weird okay so that moment when you stop being george the barman yeah and you become george the photographer how long did you deny that to yourself do you know what i mean so yeah, so I worked quite a, quite a few jobs between that pub job and becoming full time. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I worked in bars, I worked in pubs, restaurants, cafes. Uh, I did data entry stuff for a, a surveying company, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, but from all of those jobs, I've learned all these different little skills that have helped out. Yeah. With um, actually running my own business, and yeah. that that was what four or five maybe even six years between getting my first camera and actually doing it and then going full time after that last job sort of thing. Okay. What was Um, your last job before you went full time? Data entry. Right. So you were doing data entry for a surveyors. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Data entry and photography have no link whatsoever. No. What (laughs) was the cause of you to go, Oh, I've done this. I'm done with this. I want to be a photographer. So uh, I initially actually started out full time, ju- like just before COVID hit. Yeah. So COVID hit. I was like, right, I'm gonna. I was like, I'm gonna go full time. Then COVID came in, wiped out all of my jobs for the next six months. I was like, damn. Okay, I've just left my job. I, yeah. I can't take furlough. I can't do anything. What the hell do I do? So I just kept pushing it yeah. like taking photos of products and people would send me stuff to take photos of and yeah. um yeah that was very odd but then i sort of got a job working from home for this surveying company and that was sort of learning excel and doing all that sort of stuff and okay dead boring um but it taught me the skills i needed to do my books for photography and stuff like yeah. that so that but you were still working right doing yeah. data entry when you made the decision to yes. be full time, yeah, 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 what what was it that so, gave you the balls <laughs> to cut ties? So it was partly due to the fact it was fixed contract, right, and partly due to the fact that I was getting more and more jobs come in. So I'd use the money from this job to upgrade my camera mm. um, and get a better quality camera, so that I could take those sort of really nice headshots, really nice portraits and product shots and food shots and all the rest of it yeah um and that that was sort of the the moment where i was like okay I'm, I'm i've got enough jobs lined up for the next six to eight months mm. my contract's about to run out let's do this thing now's the time and from that point onwards i then went right fully into photography yeah um and that the rest is history as they say what's the difference between a keen amateur and a full-on photographer. What's the difference? Because you changed in... Okay, this is pure yeah, art. Yeah, yeah. But you changed in one day from a data entry clerk who wanted to be a <laughs> photographer into so, a photographer. Yeah. So That's that a was, huge flipping step. That was a massive step. Um, one of the things that changed was the fact that I was like, right, okay, I'm going to spend every single hour now when I wake up in the morning, once the contract's over, even when the contract was still in place. um, I spent every hour possible looking for freelance jobs. So I wasn't a company at that point. I was literally just bod on my own doing my thing. Right. Um, And, you know, I was taking a few like little paid jobs, but they weren't paying enough to sort of be like, oh, okay, um, this is actually worth doing a thing until I got that six to eight months booked out. Yep. 
I wouldn't have even thought of it. So yeah. how did you how did you get where did those people come from? Where did your clients come from at the beginning? Why did they trust you? <laughs> so it was mostly through Instagram. Okay. So back in I want to say 2020 2021 sort okay. of that sort of time. Yeah. Back when Instagram was still sort of good for photography and it would show your photos to multiple people like loads and loads of people um just off the tags alone yep back when that was the case it was really really cool because i would be getting dms from people saying oh you should come and photograph this you should come and photograph this oh can you take photos of me here there and everywhere sort of thing yeah um and then that was the sort of main bit and then i got advice from you know from people that are in businesses, from accountants, from all of these different people, like mentors and everything. Mm. Um, I went out and sought the advice that I needed to actually run my business full time yep. and have it so that I don't owe a million, trillion, good zillion pounds to the tax man. Yeah, that's important. And also do it all legit. Yeah. Um, that was a big thing for me because um, my, my parents, they started their own company a, a, while ago it's no longer a thing mm -hmm. um, but they did have their own company in place and they were telling me oh it's it's a massive pain like go sole con go uh what's it go <sighs> what sole so, trader sole trader that's yeah. the one yeah go sole trader and i was like well what's the benefit between both and that's when i went to the accountants asked them yeah. and did all that sort of stuff so um yeah, that was a lot of learning very, very quickly. Mm. Um, I'm lucky. Expecting. I'm lucky in as much as that I've only ever had two jobs in my entire life. Yeah. One was uh, Obbins manager. Nice. Uh, in a, uh, I suppose people don't know what Obbins is now today because <laughs> yeah. it's long gone, which was basically a wine merchant. More than an off license, it was more of a wine merchant. And also then, weirdly, I was a training manager for Esso yeah. just before I got kidney disease. Now, the only thing is, is that, Back when I started in tattoo shops and all that, which yeah. is where we are now, yeah, yeah. Um, I had to learn everything from scratch, and you do that, but you find the right people, yeah, to help you learn. And I, th I think that's the thing as well is that it's uh, you, you do find the people you need to find quickly, mm. and that's that's a huge thing at the beginning, and that's what a lot of people don't realise as well is that when they're you, starting out on their own, that you you actually have to do so much stuff yeah it, i mean like, it, yeah people get jealous of other people's success because they go oh well it happened overnight it's like well that overnight's no. probably 10 years <laughs> yeah you're backpedaling every 10 minutes but the reason that i wanted to come back from the start is right at the beginning mm. when you were you'd acknowledge you're a photographer yeah but you're standing there going what well, i imagine how does that mentally affect you you're stood in a place people are looking they're paying you to yeah. give them images they need to promote themselves in some way. <laughs> That's got a way heavy, right? That was heavy. So my first ever job, I absolutely messed it up. Right. Like, terribly. Um, I wasn't using a flash. I wasn't doing any, you know, I wasn't using lighting or any fancy sort of yep. equipment or anything like that. Um, and that was not what I needed to do. I was relying in solely on the image on the back of the camera and not looking at the settings and not looking at all the different things. I was just sort of going, okay, well, this is a good image. And I was also only shooting JPEG. Um, I appreciate that may not mean much, um, but basically you've got two types of files. You've got RAWs and you've got JPEGs. Okay. JPEGs, they have a color cast over them. That's what you see in the back of the camera is what you get. Yep. Raws, you have a bit more freedom to edit them. So you can change. So you can change, change it light and, and color saturation nice and things yeah, like exactly. that. Exactly. Okay. Um, but yeah, so that you job see, I messed up. But after that, I was like, right, I need to know everything about this. Possibly. Did that come good? That did come good. Okay. Um, but that was a lot of work to get it to come good. Okay. So, so you've you've you dropped the ball on your first gig, yeah. right? But that ball dropping probably gave you a foundation in knowledge that you would yeah. have not had had you dropped that ball right oh for sure like you you learn more from your mistakes than you ever will sort of actually reading up or watching tutorials or going to teachers and lessons i have to tell you, you yeah failures are important yeah okay exactly. because failures are how you learn about how to do everything if you become one of these people though who buys into the failure and yeah. is identified by that 
So I, oh, I failed at this. I failed with the woman I was seeing. Yeah, I failed yeah. at the job I was in. Yeah, the only reason you did that is because you weren't prepared to work for it in the first place and you think everything's coming to you. If you don't work at what you want to be, mm. yeah, it's not going to happen. These podcasts as well, this isn't my first rodeo, you know. I've yeah, been in course, radio yeah. for years and I, <laughs> and also wanting, wanting something for myself. But also I'm sitting here thinking... I've got, you know, a million quids worth of cameras. I've got, a fi- <laughs> all right, it's not a million, but you know what we I mean? Wish, we wish it was. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, we've got all the right stuff. We're not children. We're not playing at this. This is what yeah. we're doing. But these cameras don't mean anything because if I didn't know how to do what I was doing, yeah, exactly. then maybe everyone would have switched off by now. Are you still there? <laughs> Who knows? Right. So <laughs> it goes back to the question, how do you know when you have stopped being an amateur with a camera and you've become a professional photographer? Because you dropped that ball and now you've learned a whole lot more from that. When did you start saying, hi, I'm George, I'm a photographer? I think the the moment I properly started saying that was when I could hold my camera and tell you what every single dial and button did without even looking and could do it with my eyes closed. I spent hours, like countless hours just trying every setting on my camera making sure it was perfect making sure that if i did certain amount of dial turns it was set to that specific setting that i needed yeah and when i was able to do all of that and when i was able to uh get the image that i had in my brain into the camera and then out onto the screen or onto the print Mm. that's when i was like okay yeah i'm a photographer now that's when i started saying it but even saying that now is like it's bizarre to say because the it's, thing yeah. the thing about imposter syndrome is is that you you have to stay humble, right? Oh yeah. In everything you do. Yeah. Um you can be assured that you're good at it, right? Yeah. That's not the same as being arrogant, right? Knowing that you can do something basically is proving time and time again that you can. Yeah, exactly. But you're defined by your last failure or your you know, your last yeah. job. Yeah, so yeah, if yeah. you drop the ball on a thing and everyone talks about it, no one's gonna remember the two hundred and fifty amazing jobs you did yep. and the hundred and fifty <laughs> million pounds you've earned. They're gonna remember the twenty quid job that yeah, didn't exactly. go well. And nine times out of ten, it's probably not through your own fault. It's yeah. through the perception of, of a customer who's expecting something that they didn't tell you about. Yeah. I mean, how have you found that? Like with your with your metal work and stuff like that? I mean I've been so lucky. Right. Yeah. But is it luck or, or do I really know what I'm doing? Yeah. Right. Because yeah, yeah. imposter syndrome is very real for me. It is something that I am conscious of. But these people, um, Lee, who is involved with this podcast, he is another presenter who you will meet. Yeah. Lee, who has just married Nikki, Lee and Nikki were my best customers and still are. Yeah. I've furnished half their house. So every time I built this thing, I would go in the van with Rick, yeah. Who, yeah, yeah. who works with me. And, you know, helps me do the woodworker stuff because I'm no good at it. Um, And I would be almost to the point of being physically sick because I am so worried about the end result. Yeah. Right. At no point has anyone ever said, what on earth is that piece of crap? Yeah. Right. Nobody's ever said that to me. And I'm waiting for that day still. Now, Metal Machine... um, is my fabrication company. Yeah. Okay. So I make furniture, industrial furniture, but I'm also a welder and do fabrication. Yeah. Right. The tattoo shop where we're sat in now is my everyday business. So basically metal machine was only ever supposed to be my hobby to keep me out of trouble. (laughs) Stop me being in the boozer or putting drugs in my face. Right. Because if I'm busy, I don't fall down. Yeah, exactly. So, to suddenly have all of these people come to me and go, oh, I've heard you made this for so-and-so. Can you make this for me? I was yeah. like, no. What? Yeah, what okay. <laughs> but then in the back of my head, I'm going, well, you can make that. What's your problem? Yeah. And the problem is imposter syndrome. I don't believe in myself enough to be fully, you know, fully confident in yeah. saying I can do that. So uh, I can do that and I've never failed. Yeah. Apart from last week. Oh, really? Yeah. Go on. This is a life lesson. Oh, no. (laughs) I took on a build, which was a wooden box build console table with two legs. Okay. Okay. This console table with two legs and a drawer was to go in this lady called Patricia's house. And she commissioned me to do it. I told her at the beginning, this is not what I do. Yeah, yeah. 
this is wood fabrication. You need to go to Harry or or somebody who's yeah, you know yeah. who knows what he's doing. But she said, no, 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 that's fine. But to keep it cheap, can we use veneer? And I'm like, yeah, that yeah, that's fine. In the end, I just went, yeah, okay, that's fine. You yeah. know, we'll just do it. Okay. Um, the veneer was put on the wood. Everything yeah. was fine. It was all made, and then it bubbled up. No, because we did not know how properly to use yeah, this yeah, thin. Yeah. It's it's an eighth of a mil for God's sake, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's thin, and and the glue got moved. Long story short, didn't work. Yeah. But at all points, I talked to the customer, and at all it's points, I reminded them, saying, "This is not what I do." So in the end, I paid back her deposit. Yeah. Right. That console table with two legs is in that office of yeah. mine now because actually i sanded it all down and it, it looks great for me and yeah, i'll yeah. use that but the lesson i learned was you're only ever going to be told yeah, yeah that you can't do something or it's gone wrong or it's bad if you didn't know what you were doing in the yeah, first exactly. place now you get me to weld together a table and put some planks on it i'm never going to mess that up so I've, I've got a question for you then okay you describe yourself as a metal fabricator and a welder at mm. what point did you go from gym distortion mm. to i'm a welder i'm a metal fabricator that's what i do because it, it must have gone from one point from when it was a hobby to going yeah. full-time into your when people started coming to me mm. to ask for me to make them furniture bespoke when people believed in me enough, again, mostly through Instagram and word of mouth. Yeah. Word of mouth is the best way of doing everything. Yep. Right. I've been in this tattoo shop, Madhouse Tattoo, for 12 years. And that was built on word of mouth and flyers through doors. Old school. So it's amazing how much effect word of mouth actually has. You tell someone you've been somewhere and they're friends of yours, they'll mm -hmm. believe you. Even yeah. if the tattoo you've got on you is rubbish which happens a lot, you know, that people yeah. have gone, and I'm like, why did you go there? And they said, well, my mate went there and theirs was all right. And then you look at a picture of their mate's tattoo and it's terrible. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? People come here now because they know they're going to get looked after. Yeah. And they're also in a place that's happy, you know, and positive. Yeah. And the people who work with me, Mickey and Talon, are lovely people who genuinely want the best for their clients. Yeah. They've all worked for years to get where they're going. The metal thing was only ever going to be a hobby, right? Right. But then people started trusting me. And when people trust you, right, that changes your perception of what you do. Yeah, for sure. Because all of a sudden you're like, oh, hang on. You're, you're paying me to do this thing that I thought I was only a little bit good at or I was sort of just getting by doing. Yep you want me to do that for money. Mm. That is just bizarre. It's a bizarre feeling. Do you know what the biggest, sorry, but head fuck is in all of this? When you are trying to price something. Oh God. So you price, so I have got metal costs and I've got wood costs and now I've got my time and my time's like, oh, well, don't worry about that part. Yeah, yeah. I've learned that you have to worry about that part. Yep. Right? <laughs> you have to get your time paid for and how you do it. Now, obviously, a piece of furniture that I want to make that takes time, because I want to do it, I will usually come in cheaper because it's not about the money. Yeah, exactly. That's not how I make my living. Well, yeah. it kind of is now. But, <laughs> you know, back, back then, it's not the main way. Yeah. So, basically, COVID changed that. I right. couldn't... All the tattoo shops were closed. So, COVID... My only source of removing myself from my house was to go to my workshop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody else is at the workshop. It's just me. So I went into that workshop and people were wanting tables left, right and centre, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. bits of furniture, shelving units, this and that. Wheel and then, stoves. Yeah, wheel stoves, wheel indeed. Stoves. indeed. <laughs> because they'd found me online because they had the time to do it. And yeah. that was my busiest time. Now, I didn't have time to be worried about whether I could do these things. I just had to do it. One man band. Got to do it all. Yep. <laughs> so we did that. And because I was self-employed, yeah, we only got the self-employment payment. Right. And that's all we got. We didn't get any grants for this shop. We didn't get any anything. That's all we got. Yeah. So I was better off than you because yeah, you didn't even get say, that. Cause, yeah, because you had to be in business for three years prior to be able to well, luckily, claim that. Luckily, I've been self-employed now for 150 years yeah, at yeah, the very yeah. least. So, you know, <laughs> and in this job, 12. But Metal Machine... Because it had to yeah. come from 
a hobby to actual people trusting me, I, I had to step up and yeah. succeed. And I, I did fail in one job, which nobody knows about. So I bought all the stock, the metal stock, made the job, and basically the whole thing was wonky. No. I'd done, I'd, I couldn't read a tape measure for some reason at this point, right. right? So what I did was, is I chopped it all up, put it in the scrap bin, made it again at my own cost. Nice. Because it's not on the end user that I messed it up. It's on me. No, of course not. So yeah. I made it right. So yeah, 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 okay, I failed, and it's cost me, but I've never looked stupid in front of a customer. And that's a that's a very important thing to be able to do. Well, just because because if you suddenly turn round and validate your own imposter syndrome by not being able to do what you do, then all your world comes crumbling around you. Yeah. Because people will then, like I told you, they will only talk about the failures. Yeah, and that's a that's a uh, yeah. Because if when you mess up, it's the worst feeling in the world. Yeah. Because like you want to get it right for your client, you want to get it perfect, you want to get it all good, and that does add to the whole. What the hell am I doing? Am I even in the right job? Do I know what I'm actually yeah. doing? What am I playing at? All of so, all of that doubt. Yeah. And the trouble is, it's a confirmation of that syndrome. It's a confirmation yeah. that you are an imposter. You ha you shouldn't be doing what you're doing. Yeah. yeah. And you get that knock as, as confidence, whoever you are. Now look, I'm quite a confident human being. Never. In, well, you know, <laughs> in as much as that I will talk to anybody yeah, and I yeah. will do what I have to do to make a situation right. But when it comes to this place, this tattoo shop, yeah. or it comes to Metal Machine and its end products, I am never taking for granted that, oh, it'll just happen. No. Because if you do that, it shows you don't care enough. And when you stop caring... You get lazy. You get lazy. When you get lazy and you stop working and striving to move forwards, you go backwards. Yeah. And then what happens is, and I've seen it happen to a lot of tattooists, oh, I've reached my level, I don't need to do anything else, I'm yep. this, I'm that. Yeah, you are, and you're done. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you can go around and eventually, you know, people won't come to you anymore because you don't care about what you do, right? These guys are young here, they care, you, yeah, know, yeah, yeah. you know, the people I've worked with have all cared about what they're doing. But if I stop caring about the people's reaction and I stop being nervous before I deliver those things, yeah. I think then I've got a problem. Yeah. That's the, that's the, that's the thing though. It's like, it's, it's, so how you can't, you can't be nervous when you, if, if you're providing something for someone, you, you need that confidence to be able to say, yeah, I can do that. Mm. But you, you've got to go at it in a way that isn't arrogant and isn't, driven entirely by ego because mm. that is the worst thing you can do if you're driven by knowledge and ability yes then you know you can do something yeah but at no point do i think in this place i have utmost confidence in mickey and talon i yeah. know yeah, yeah, they yeah, can yeah. deliver the things they did because if they didn't we'd be closed and done yeah, exactly. with metal machine however it's all on me that is the only thing where it's my show. Yeah. It's my thing. You know, with this podcast, I've got you as my producer. I've got Lee, who's, you know, a co-presenter, but yeah, also yeah, yeah. a researcher and a calmer head than I am. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So there are people around me, you know, and also I involve my family and everything. You know, yeah. I talk to my wife about what I do. I talk to my kid about, you know, his perception of things. I feel, so you, I feel like as a, as a business owner, though, you do take that with you whenever you leave work the moment you leave work you've you've still got it in the back of your head because you've got stuff going on and yeah. it will come into conversations like because that happens to me all the time that's life well you yeah. you recently just got married well yeah so congratulations on that Thank you very so much. your wife now is the person that you where before it might have been you know your girlfriend because obviously you yeah, know, yeah, yeah but it might have been your mum or your dad or whatever the first port of call probably for you will change now yeah. to your wife yeah, because she's the one that has to deal with your shit every day. You yeah. know what I mean? When you're freaking out and she has no idea she's why. Like, what the hell are you freaking out about? And you're like, oh, it's just this job. And she, oh, it's fine then. You're going to be fine. Yeah, but also, it's, you know, yeah, you need to have somebody. And this is the one problem with being a solo act completely. Yeah, if you've got no one to talk to, or no one to lean on, even if it's your mate, somebody yeah, yeah. who is your designated talker to yeah <laughs> do you know what i mean so if you feel and i've been now i've been completely alone and having to deal with things and that mm. wasn't good right so when i when i first got sick after my drug yeah bullshit yeah, yeah. right and come out there was nobody 
yeah. around. Damn. And in a way that was kind of good because I didn't have to change myself to anything, but I did have my dog, Sky, right? Mm. Now, Sky would come, she knew I was sick, right? Somebody else had looked after her while I was in hospital and all of that. And right. we'd made arrangements because obviously, you know, we thought it was going to go wrong. So, but then when I got home, she would come and sit and then like yeah. be where I was. Or if I went to bed, she would come and lie on the bed. But also, this will sound really weird, but I talked to her. Yeah. Because she'd fucking listen because she had no choice. She was a dog. Yeah, exactly. Right. But then <laughs> even that communication saved me from going stir crazy and not basically falling into a well of self absorbed rubbish. Yeah. Because I voiced what was wrong with me, even to the dog. <laughs> Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. That's the thing. So, what's your coping mechanism with imposter syndrome? How do you, because it does come to you because we both mentioned <laughs> yeah. it today. Yeah, that's true to be fair. So when it comes to, when it's when it's for me, when I get the imposter syndrome kick in is when like a big brand will kick, like will come to me and say, oh, can you do photos for this event? Or can you do video for this certain thing? And if it's a brand that I know well or a brand that I know is a is one of those bigger brands or like a bigger company for example mm. then i sort of have to stop and go right hang on wait why are you coming to me yep what do i offer that other people aren't offering right now so that and terrifying situation yeah. kicks in the yeah. syndrome right that kicks how, it in. how do you get past it i <laughs> honestly i take a step back mm -hmm. so i will see the email come in or i'll have the call and do that and i'll be like right okay I'll have it all written down in notes or whatever and stuff like that. Yeah. And I'll put my phone down, put everything down and I'll just stop for a solid half hour and just take it and be like, right, how do I respond to this? How do I deal with this client, for example? Mm. Like, What do I do in this case to make sure that it, that they get the professional version of me? Yeah. Yeah. I've got and, you. and also, are confident enough in my response that I am able to get the job and actually work with them and do all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So I, I always, I have to take a step back. I can't. So you, the way you cope yeah. is by holding it out, giving yourself the space to look yeah. at all points. Because if, if, if I don't step back and take a look at everything and look at where that job has come from and where that has potentially, where that could potentially lead. Yeah. If I don't stop and look at that, then... I will just go, yeah, yeah, cool, I can do it, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. then going into the job, I'm like, oh, God, what if I fuck this up? What if I like yeah. really fuck up on this? So the way like, you stop imposter syndrome yeah. kicking in is just by giving yourself the space to analyse the whole thing. Yeah, I have to. Just in, just one, you are getting bigger brands and all that. I was here yeah. when you got a phone call from, yeah. you, no, you were with me in my office and you got a phone call from this big, we won't, can't mention names. Nope, sorry. Sorry about that. But it's pretty <laughs> huge and there's a lot going on with it. And I remember you, I remember you putting the phone down and you said, oh my God, that's terrifying. Yeah. But obviously you're happy because this has gone yeah, on. Yeah, but yeah. you know, that, that self-doubt, okay, imposter yeah. syndrome, whatever you want to call it, that self-doubt is the thing I think that keeps you humble. Is it necessarily, is it, ne as long as it's not out of control and you've found a way to cope, it's not necessarily negative, is it? I, sometimes. I say sometimes it's imposter syndrome can be negative. Okay. Um, in for the sense instance? That, for, in, in the sense that when I did take that phone call, I was like, oh my God, that was terrifying. Yeah. If there was no one around me and I'd had that phone call, I'd just be sitting there for that half hour, sitting yeah. back going, ah, oh, right, what do I do here? Mm. How do I deal with this? What the hell is going on? Why have they done that? Why are they reaching out to me? That I think that was that your happy, first question. Yeah, you, you, to me, why me? Was like, why? Yeah, why have hell? they come to me? And I said because you're good at what you do. Because obviously, I see the other right. side of you, right? I see the right because we cock about, you know. Yeah, there's a lot of talking, but we when you've made a film about me, yeah. you've done all of our Eye of the Needle podcasts. Yeah, yeah you've and we've worked together. It feels quite a lot, and yeah. we know each yeah, other yeah, quite yeah. well. But also, when you're in work mode. You, you do things, you set it all up, you did all this and we were talking rubbish yeah, and yeah. We, we set all this up. So I have no doubt in you and your ability because I know right. you can do it. You have the doubt in your ability. Yes, exactly. Because I won't, 
this is oh, this is a bit of a dawning thing, right? So yeah. because I have no negativity towards you and your abilities, because yeah. I don't know that your limits, because yeah, yeah, yeah. as far as I've seen, there aren't any. <laughs> therefore, I would expect you. Well, yeah, <laughs> but I, therefore, I would expect you to be able to do most things that I throw at you. Yeah, yeah. Because you have. Well, yeah, that's true. But you see the doubt because y- yeah. you're not as sure of you as I am of you. Yeah, exactly. Which is a bit odd, isn't it? It, it is, and it's it's. I, I, you know, I've always wanted to know this. This is a bit off topic, but what did you think initially when I reached out and said I want to make a film with you? Okay, so a bit of backstory, a bit of tangent there. I got <laughs> I got an unsolicited uh, no <laughs> no. I got an unsolicited message from George saying, "Hey." Uh, seen you on Instagram know who you can't did you know who I was though from the yeah, music so and the I knew, bullshit I knew who you were through the music and stuff so I did did music college and my uh, my main tutor was Rappo as you know Mark Rapson yeah yeah um, and so I just sort of heard of you like around Hartford sort of local famous local famous sort of thing <laughs> I was like oh yeah I know him yeah like, yeah cool and then I saw you did this metal machine thing I was like oh that's cool yeah I was sort of just sort of starting to get into the video side of things. Mm. I wanted to test my skills out. So I was like, well, do you want to do this? Do you want to do that? So my first reaction with anyone offering me something for free is like, what's the catch, man? Yeah. Because we're all so jaded by the bad side of the internet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then when some real opportunity does come along, you're going to question that too often. But I didn't with you. Because I saw you and I saw some people that you knew and I thought, okay, you're Hartford, you want to do this. I don't know what I was expecting. Right. (laughs) But I said yes. Um, But I think I even asked you what your agenda was, didn't I? Yeah. In a beautiful fashion. (laughs) You, I can't remember what it was. I think we met here first, didn't we? Yeah, I said we need to meet first. We need to meet first before we do anything else. I was like, yeah, cool, whatever. Like, that's fine. Um and I came up here and it was t- it was in the tattoo shop, wasn't it? Yeah, it was here. And I couldn't initially find it. Um, so I was, <laughs> I think it was about 10 minutes late, which wasn't really boding well for me. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have to say that there are maltings where Madhouse Tattoo is. We've got the whole top floor, but to find that top floor is impossible. Yeah, right? there's like so, five different stairwells and a million different <laughs> things. It's like, and a hundred how? million stairs. Oh, so many stairs. <laughs> so many stairs. Um but I remember walking up and seeing the Madhouse sign on the stair below and I was like, yeah. oh, it's, it's it's up here, cool. So I knocked on the door and I can't remember if it was you or, or Mickey or someone who answered the door. I think it was Mickey, yeah. Yeah. And she said, oh, you're here to see Jim. I was like, yeah. So I went through to your office, said hello, did all the stuff. Mm. And I remember that first conversation being very much like, who are you? What do you want? Mm. How does this work? Yeah. And I was, I came in, I was like, well, I'm just going to be myself in this situation Mm. because I could tell from the offset that you were like no nonsense. You knew what you, you knew what you're about. So I was like, well, okay, you know what you're about. I'm just going to be me. If you like that, you'd like that. If you don't, you don't. And then we can work together or not. When you came into the office and you sat down, I had already decided I'm quite hard ass about things. Yeah. Right. I come from a, uh, this sounds a wank, whichever way you put it, but I come from a yeah, criminal yeah. background. I come from where the people around me yeah. are the difference between life and death. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that equates a little bit to the way I live my life still. Obviously yeah, not yeah, the yeah. same. But I just thought, you know what? If you're going to do this and you're wasting my time, I'm going to give it to you. Yeah, of course. Right? But you came in and you were humble and you were like, look, I just want to learn more about video and yeah. I want a chance to just do it. And I've seen what you do. And I thought, do you know what? That's perfect. Yeah. Right? Because how many times... Have I wanted to do something new and somebody's given me a chance? Yeah. Even now, you know, the yeah, reason yeah, I'm yeah. doing, you know, I back in, um, back when I was work, doing the Saturday breakfast show for Recharge Radio in London, yeah. Jordan Thomas, who, who owned the station, gave me a chance. I was a guest on another show with yeah. my music hat on. And he said to me, mate, that was great. Yeah, do, yeah. You, do you want to do a show? And I'm like, and at first I said, no, I can't do that. Yeah. imposter syndrome <laughs> and then he phoned me about a week later and said look mate we need someone to do the breakfast show and i said i can only do it if i have a, somebody else like i said to you yeah. i can only do these shows if i've got a producer yeah, somebody exactly. who can make the tech happen because i'm a stump yeah right? i can't <laughs> do that all this 
you know, whistles and bells. I, I don't do that. I can't do that. That's why you're here. Well, yeah. Well, right? it wasn't until recently that I was able to do all of well, this that's anyway. It. So, But, you know, this is the thing. So I think what I did, my reaction initially was distrust because that's my go-to. Yeah. But then I talked to you and you were sincere and you weren't trying to impress me with any rubbish. You were yeah, just yeah, like, yeah. I want a chance to do this. Can we do it? So we did. And that, I think that was probably one of the most nervous times I've had mm -hmm. meeting a potential client or some, or anything like that or potential someone who I could work with. Mm. That was the most nervous I've been because it wasn't someone coming to me. It was me going yeah. to you and saying, fancy video? Yeah. You'd like, and also, you, I mean, I could have reacted in any way as well. I could have been negative. I could yeah. have been anything. I could have been an asshole because I'm capable of that. <laughs> but hopefully, right. hopefully I wasn't, you know, but be, and I kind of know I wasn't because we're sat here yeah, now yeah. We're still working together yeah. and doing different things. And I think, um, I think because you were true to yourself mm. and explained what you wanted, right? That was important to me. And I can smell bullshit a mile away. Yeah, exactly. I've lived a long life and I've been around people who lie for a living and it's boring. Yeah. Right? I live a life of truth. Yeah. That's why all these podcasts are about the truth. That I yeah, have the exactly. needle podcast for the tattoo shop, which we do with Talon and Mickey, and you produce that. Yeah, yeah. That's all of our truths. That's real things. We don't make things up. Our lives are chaotic and mad enough as it is. Yeah. So when you came to me with your truth about wanting to learn it and do it, and then actually did it, that's the key. Yeah. Because if, if you say you, get, you, you can't be working for yourself, say you're going to do something and then not follow through. Because if you don't follow through, people aren't going to trust you. No. And then that will spread about you. That's where word of mouth can be a negative thing. And if you mess up and you don't follow through with your actions, then people the go, worst what are you doing? trait in anyone who is self-employed is to be unreliable. Yep. And there are so many of my friends who who wonder, you know, what what's doing this, and they've hired someone, and they phone me up and go, he hasn't turned up, and I'm like, well, did you what? What, yeah. what did you expect? You know, we said to you, He's but you know, up, some yeah. some people don't think that that's important. And I, I promise you, they're like, oh, well, I'll still get it. They'll go, I'll go another day. It'll be all right. It won't. Yeah, it won't. Because no. if you don't have integrity and you don't have the honesty with yourself to know that that's a bad situation, you ain't never going to make it. Yeah, exactly. You might swindle a few people along the way and get paid a little bit, but eventually that door will close. Yeah, exactly. So I think what we're trying to say, like a coping mechanism for imposter syndrome as well, yeah. is, is integrity. It's got to be, you've got to be, if, if you're not, if you're not true to yourself when you're doing the things that you do mm. and, you know, and the imposter syndrome kicks in and you're just sat there like, ah, if you're, if you don't stop and say, right, well, they've done this for a reason. They've hired me for a reason. They've hired you for a reason. That's that. Like, we've got to do it. That's why they've hired us. They've looked the, at all our work before. You see, what you don't know when these jobs come in as well is how yeah. they found you and why they're talking to you. Exactly. Now, if you, if you automatically assume that somebody's sung your praises, right, or yeah. you just think, oh, they've stumbled across me on the internet, yeah. whatever the reason is, everyone should be treated the same, the same respect, the same time, the yeah. same reverence to the job you're being given. Yeah, exactly. Right, because if you hold everything up in front of you calmly and have a look at the reality of it, don't ever be afraid to say no to a client as well. Yeah, exactly. You can't please everyone. So I should have said no to the lady with that console table because I didn't know what I yeah. was doing. And I've learned a lesson now. The only jobs that I take on through Metal Machine are ones I know I can do or mm. will push me and use the talents yeah. I have because you can't self-limit to be safe. That's very true. But I'm not a woodworker. I'm not a veneer specialist. Sod all that, mate. I don't know yeah. anything about all that stuff. That You have to use an iron or a press. And I'm like, no, no, no. So I should have known that that was not my wheelhouse. And I should have been all right. I've got to stop hitting that lead. Cool. Should have been all right with saying no. Yeah. And that really is a lesson in life. If you don't think you can do something well, the people who are asking you will respect you more and bear you in mind for something else if you turn it down, but you do it in such a way that you explain why. Yeah. So you say, I can't do this because I tell you what, it's not in my wheelhouse. I can give you somebody else if you can, or you just say, I'm really sorry, but this isn't mine. This is what I do. Yeah. Tell them what you do and they may well come back around. I've had that.
So, I've turned down jobs and they've come back to me with the job that I could do. So when you do turn down jobs or if you do turn down jobs, mm. do you give them to you, other people that you would trust with that job? Because in, in my world, if I get a really, like if I get a client come to me and say, look, I need someone who specializes in video, I go, I'm not your person. Mm. That's not me. I'm, I specialize in stills and I always have done, always will do. Yeah. But I offer video as a service that I can offer. Yeah. I have people that I work with that specialize in video, don't even touch stills. Mm -hmm. So I'll go, right, you need these people because they are the best people for this job. Yep. Do you have people like that? And, and also what is your way of dealing with your imposter syndrome when you have, when it does kick in? Okay. My imposter syndrome way of dealing with things is very, very similar to yours. Yeah. So I, if somebody comes to me with a table... Yeah. which is, like I say, planks and a welded frame. I know all day long I can do that. My doubt comes in when it's down to the finish. Mm. So how do you want it? What do you want to like? How do you do that? My imposter syndrome then is to find a way in my brain how to do it. So I look at the build. Yeah. Um, I am famous in my own head for knee-jerk answering people. Right. Yeah. So what I try and do now because I'm 50 this year and I should know better, is give myself the room to answer people in, an, in a knowledgeable way. Yeah. So somebody asked me the other month to make um, a bracket okay. and a frame to hold up an airplane prop. I remember you telling me about this. Yeah. Right. So my initial reaction is, what? <laughs> yeah. You want me to what? And then I gave myself, instead of answering the thing going, uh, don't know. Yeah, yeah. I went back and I thought, okay, what do I need? Prop's got a hole in the middle. Right. And then you need just some way of screwing on to that, that bracket, which goes through the prop, tightens it up and puts on the wall. Yeah. So I realized then I could do it. And I realized the best way would be to have a dome. Yeah. So never made a dome, but I knew how to do it. Yeah. So I told the man exactly that. I said, I can do this. I can make the bracket. Um, we need to find a dome or I can have a go at making one, but we'll work it out. Yeah. So I looked at buying a dome and it was a hundred million billion pounds. So I made one and found out the way of doing that. So you heat up sheet metal, cut a hole yeah. into wood, bang it with a hammer. And end result is the man's really happy because I communicated the fact that I needed time. Mm. I needed to find a way to do it. And that if I couldn't do it, that was an option. But at no point was that an option for me. I had to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I did. And it, 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 the guy has it and he's hung it on his wall. So the way of dealing with it is step back. Look at all the aspects of it. Is yeah. there a gray area? If there is a gray area, is there someone you can talk to? Because I'm very lucky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Robin from Mill Green Forge yep. is a good friend of mine who basically is used to me phoning him up going, I've dropped the ball. <laughs> what the hell do I do? And he goes, calm down, mate. You've done it all. All yeah, you need to do yeah. is this, this and this. So I do have a safety net. But obviously I'm a man and my ego doesn't like safety nets. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I take things on on my abilities based on the fact that I'm 99% sure that I can do the job. Right. Metal machine is a strange one because the imposter syndrome never goes away. Right. Even if it is making a table, but my ability to deal with it gets it is, easier yeah. over time. Yeah. But I don't have imposter syndrome in here, in this tattoo shop. I've been involved in tattoo shops for 25 years. I know exactly what's possible in this shop. And it's not arrogance. That's knowing your business. Yeah. I, I mean, knowing your business and arrogance is, they are, they are a very close thing though. Mm. They are very, very close. Because Only there's... if it's misguided and you don't listen. Yes. Yes. Right. With all of these things that we're going to talk about on 50 and Coping, yeah. question mark. It's important. Question mark. Question mark. Right? The question mark shows that it's both sides of the coin. We'll talk about that. Now, <laughs> the reason that I talk about all these different mental health issues and what we're going through isn't because I've been through them all and I know it all. Yeah. It's because it interests me and I want to help people and we want to find a way that everyone copes. We've talked about our coping mechanism for this. Yeah. Right? But communication with yourself, with others who can help, with outside influences... Yeah. Communication is the key to all of this. 
Oh yeah, for sure. And and that's one thing I found from from the Eye of the Needle podcast, and also uh, the big podcast with everyone in. Yeah, the f- that first episode sort of mm. thing. Um, that what I found from that is there are so many different like you you can look at someone and they you have no idea what they're going through or what they have been through. Exactly that. And f- hearing people talk about their coping mechanisms, hearing hearing people talk about how what they've been through and how they dealt with it, that was really eye opening to me. Like, oh, I got this tattoo for this reason or that reason or blah blah blah. Mm. Um, I haven't got tattoos yet. No. Yet. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it's it's very interesting to me to to be behind the camera and sort of hear those different mm. experiences and see sort of hear how that can be dealt with mm. and it's helpful for me as well because if stuff like that does come up in my life well i'll know there's certain ways you can deal with this stuff yeah and i coping think it's a very mechanisms. important thing to know yeah coping mechanisms yeah. are it yeah you know what whatever you've whatever you've dipped into in life you're gonna have every single person on this planet unless they're a completely self-assured narcissist <laughs> at some point is going to have a wobble in some direction yeah. be that big or small whatever it, the size of the wobble doesn't matter but the coping mechanism does yeah and that's why this podcast hopefully is going to show people's coping mechanisms be it from you know insane drug addiction yeah. alcoholism to depression bipolar to just to dealing with parenthood to bereavement to yeah. everyday stress and strain in different jobs this podcast can show hopefully yeah some good ways of dealing with it but also shows the way the bad ways bit good bad yeah. if you can weigh up your your objectives and your end goals like not end goals objectives same yeah, thing yeah, yeah. but if you can weigh up the whole situation um with you know i don't know knowledge from somewhere if we can give people some coping mechanisms that have worked for others, yeah. they may be able to formulate their own, and I think that's important. Well, exactly. Right, mate. We've reached the time. We've reached the time. Okay, it should be said that I Have the Needle podcast is on Spotify and Google. That's a tattoo shop-based podcast, which is totally for the end user, the person being tattooed. It's not a tattoo industry thing, even though it'd be relevant to them. Um, the mental health podcasts we talked about are on this YouTube channel where you're watching this. Um, search for Jim Distortion Podcasts. Um, you may not see George for a while because he will be behind the cameras and producing him. I'll be there. Thank him for that. <laughs> and we will meet Lee next time. Please, if you want to support us, we do have a Patreon and it's called 50 and Coping. We'll see you again. With a question mark. Question mark. Don't forget the question mark. (laughs)